Amen. Sunday school is dismissed at this time. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Can you turn us down just a little bit? Sometimes, uh, before we get into this, I just want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you. Glad you could join us this morning. We pray the Holy Ghost is coming right through that camera to you because the Holy Ghost is here this morning. And he's moving in such a way that I want him to move all the time. Amen. We want God to move this way all the time. So we welcome you, those who may be watching up in Maine and those who are watching in, in uh, India and so forth. Uh, God bless you this morning. We acknowledge your presence and we thank you. As I was driving here this morning, I, I had my message all planned. Yeah, last night I got done early with my message. I was so happy, you know. I'm glad when I have my message done. So I had it done. I was on my way to church this morning, and I got to the corner of Allen Street and County Street. And all of a sudden, this wind picked up. I mean, it was forceful. And I saw the tree and the leaves begin to rumble. And I saw that, and God spoke to me and said, I want you to preach about the mulberry tree. And I said, Lord, again. Last week you changed my message. This week you're changing my message. You changed the order of the service. You changed the song selection. You, you're changing me. And that's what his presence does. It changes us. Now, some people don't like that, and they get a little uncomfortable, but you know what? It's good stuff. Amen. It's good stuff. So if you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope you do, I want to try to stay in the presence of the Holy Spirit because I believe that God has some remedies for us of when we go through the battles of life and we go through the trials and the tribulations and we, we go through all kinds of difficulties, God wants you to know that he sees it all the time. Can I get a good amen? Hallelujah. God sees it all the time and he wants you to know that he's every day present with you. Look in your Bibles, please, to First Chronicles. First Chronicles. I'm glad that God moved that way. I'm glad that he, uh, he moved in such a way that now I only have about 30 minutes to preach. Because if I start going past 12 o'clock, I see all these people going like this, looking at their clock and wondering what time I'm going to end. And, uh, but if you have your Bibles, please open to First Chronicles chapter 14. I'm going to start with verse 8 because I believe this is one of the most prophetic points of our service today, what God's doing today in our service. The Bible says, And when the Philistines heard that David was anointed. Hear me now. When the Philistines heard that David was anointed king over all of Israel, all of the Philistines went up to seek David. And David heard of it and went out against them. The title of my message is, When the Anointing Comes, the Pressure Gets Greater. When the Anointing Comes, when God's Holy Spirit shows up, when He begins to move, hallelujah, then things will get more difficult. When we begin to fast and pray, when we begin to do this on Monday nights, I was going to do it originally on Wednesday, but Linda talked me out of it. She said, you know, people on Wednesday night on, on Facebook, they're looking forward to a teaching. So I said, okay, well, we'll keep it that way. But, you know, Monday we're going to go into a time of prayer. And what we're praying for is for God to move. But not to move in New Bedford, not to move in the United States, not to move in the state of Massachusetts, but for God to move in me, in you, 
Amen. And we're going to continue on that realm. And I want you to pass this on. If you know anybody, you can know some past pastors that you may know, some people from other churches, whatever. If you want to tell them, say, we're having a time where we're gathering together for prayer for God to move in me and to move in you. And if you're interested, we're going to meet here on Mondays at 7 o'clock. And we're going to pray maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half, maybe two, maybe half an hour, whatever, however the Holy Spirit moves. We're going to pray and we're going to seek the Lord. Amen. And we're going to come to the altar. We're not going to sit in our chairs like lullaby babies. We're going to come down to the altar. That's the place. You have to understand, whenever God began to move, whenever God began to anoint, they always did it at an altar. They always did it at a place of consecration. The altar has lost its flavor in many churches today. The altar has lost its spot in many churches today. But I want you to know, as long as I'm the pastor of this church, we're always going to have an altar, because you saw what happened this morning at the altar. You can say, well, God can do it in a chair, but he didn't. He did it at the altar. And if you want to sit in the chair and you want to sit there and say to God, well, you can do it right here, well, guess what? Go without. And you'll continue to go without, but I'm telling you right now, for the time that we're living in, we need the anointing. For the time that we're living in, we need the anointing. Because I believe that God spoke to me when I saw that tree and the rustling of that tree. He said, get ready because the enemy is going to get mean. Are you hearing me? The enemy is going to get meaner and meaner and meaner, and he's going to, his attacks are going to be far greater than they've ever been before. If you don't think so, read your Bible. In the book of Revelation, it says that he, gave, he was given power over the saints. Come on. You can stand there and quote Scripture all you want, but if you ain't living it, come on now. You've got to live it. You've got to have a heart of forgiveness, as, as Vicky was saying this morning. No bitterness, no anger, no, no unforgiveness in your heart and in your spirit. And it says, that when, David, when the Philistines heard that David was anointed. I want you to understand, the Philistines represent the enemy. The enemies of Israel. But when they heard, see, the Philistines were okay. They were, they were fine as long as nothing was disturbed. They were fine as, as there was no ground being taken. They, they, were, they were okay as long as the kingdom of Israel didn't advance. But the moment, the moment that there was God anointing someone, the enemy began to rise up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I got good news for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When the anointing comes, when that anointing falls, hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We're going to move in the power and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost in the church one more time. Hallelujah. I believe that the enemy has brought in infiltration enemies into the church to squash, to stifle. To hinder the moving of the Holy Ghost. But they're going to be revealed. Come on, somebody. Woo. When the Philistines heard that David was anointed. What does that mean? That means that David, there was a time when David, in the eyes of God was ready to receive that anointing. He was ready because he was consecrated to God. And the moment that David surrendered everything to God, he was anointed. He was anointed. Hallelujah. I said he was anointed. Not by man, not by a committee, not by a voting board. But he was anointed by God. God called him. God breathed upon him. God gave that unction. That stirring in his spirit. And said, David, 
I have called you. I have brought you into this place for such a time as this. And I have anointed you. I've anointed you. I've chosen you. I've anointed you. And now you must be prepared for some battles. Hallelujah. The Bible says that when they came out against David, the Philistines came and they spread themselves in the valley of Rephraim. Spread it himself out. In other words, they were well organized. There was a well organized attack. And how many know when the enemy attacks you and I, he doesn't attack us necessarily uh, physically with armies and soldiers, but spiritually. And where does he attack? He attacks our minds. He begins to sow plots and schemes in your mind. He begins to encourage you to be rebellious, stubborn. He encourages you to not listen. He encourages you to have the ideology that no one is ever going to tell me what to do. If you can't listen to a man of God, then you can't listen to God. If you don't know your Bible, read it, because that's what Paul said. When, they, when Paul spoke, they didn't take it as the word of man, the Bible says. They took it as God was speaking to them. And here's what David did. When he saw the enemy, when he saw that valley of Rephraim all filled with the enemy spread across, you can imagine what he was thinking. I had just been anointed. It's supposed to be a time of joy and celebration and jubilee. It should be a time of celebration. I've been anointed to lead the kingdom of God and Israel into the promised land and to, and to uh, wipe out the enemy. And I haven't even been anointed yet for a day. And here it comes, the Philistines. One of the greatest attacks on Christians. When the enemy comes, he speaks and says, you're not saved. You don't have the Holy Ghost. You don't need the Holy Spirit today. Holy Spirit doesn't exist. He'll say all of these things to cause you to be weak in the time when you need to be strong. Can I tell you there is an anti-Christ spirit that is released against a body of believers when there's an anointing. That antichrist is exactly that, anti, against the things of God, against Christ. Against this, against that, I don't believe this, I don't believe that, I don't believe this, I don't believe that. It's an antichrist spirit, and the Bible says in 1 John that that spirit has been around since his day. He said there is a spirit of antichrist that exists already. Why? Why does it exist? It exists to oppose the anointing. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He was reading from the book of Isaiah. He was fulfilling prophetic utterance. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me. What happened after Jesus was anointed? What happened to him when the Spirit came upon him? The Bible says the Spirit of God. Say it with me, Spirit of God. The Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted 
of the devil. There's a cost to the anointing. You've got to be able to stand in these last days, as the Bible says. Having done all to stand, stand with your loins girded with the truth. Because that's exactly where the enemy will attack you. It's in the area of truth. Is that really true? Did God really say that? Did he really mean that? But David did something. In verse 10, it says, And David, even though he had the anointing, even though he had God's blessing, he says, it says that, And David inquired of God. That means that he prayed. He was anointed. God had commissioned him for the task. God gave him the ability to complete the task with the anointing. But he had to do something. He had to inquire of the Lord and say, Lord, is this your timing? He said, shall I go up against the Philistines and wilt thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto him, don't you like it when God answers prayer immediately? Hallelujah. Can I tell you when you're in that kind of relationship with God and you're walking in the anointing, God answers prayer. And he said, the Lord said unto him, go up. For I, listen to me, not the children of Israel, not their weapons, not their abilities, not their strength. He says, for I will deliver them into your hand. That didn't happen until he was anointed. When he was anointed, now God would flow through him. To the people. And so they came up. To Baal Perizim. And David smote them there. And David said. God hath broken in upon my enemies. By my hand. Like the breaking forth of waters. Therefore they call the name of the place. Baal Perizim. Verse 12. And when they had left. They're gods. The Bible says, I believe it was Joshua. Or maybe it wasn't Joshua. Who was it? Oh, Lord, bring him to my remembrance. Where he said, let God arise. And his enemies be scattered. And when... You begin to let God arise in your life. Not just speaking words, but in your life. And you walk in that anointing that God has called you to. He will scatter your enemies. Hallelujah. He'll scatter your enemies. And when they had left their gods, there David gave a command and they burned them with fire. You cannot mix the pagan religions of this world. You cannot mix religion of this world with the anointing. You lose the anointing. You say, well, pastor, that's just for men of God. That's just for preachers. No, 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 no. The anointing's for you. The anointing's for me. The anointing's for all of us. And then the Bible says, in verse 13, when they burnt those gods, when you begin to take over land that the enemy has now put a stronghold on, 
by and through the anointing and by God, and you begin to destroy those areas in your life that the enemy has had a stronghold on. And I've heard this testimony before. People say, man, when I begin to pray and fast or I start getting closer to God, all hell breaks loose. Well, what did you expect? He's had you for so many years. He's had you in that bondage so long. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't go here. I can't go there. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. He's had you in bondage. He wants to keep you there. So the moment the anointing comes on you, and the moment that God begins to set you free, you think he's going to give up? No. The Bible says, and the Philistines yet again spread themselves abroad in the valley. How many know the enemy is relentless? He's going to come and he's going to he's going to try to convince you. He's going to come and try to do anything he can to distract you. You can't get mad at the situation. Get mad at the devil using that situation. Get mad at the enemy because behind it all, it's him. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of rulers of wickedness in high places. Let me tell you, it's not a cakewalk. It's a spiritual warfare. Just getting the church is a spiritual warfare. Come on, somebody. And so here the Philistines, they saw that David was taking ground and, and smashing and burning their idols, their gods. They were infuriated and they went back and they set themselves back up in the valley again. Most people by this time would get battle fatigue. Let me tell you something. Don't ever give in to rebellion. The moment you give in to rebellion is the moment a stronghold will come into your home. Because rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Hello! Are you hearing me this morning? The moment you give in to rebellion is the moment that witchcraft will begin to operate in your home. Philistines came and spread themselves again in the valley. Now David, what he did was, because he had now confidence in his anointing, confidence in his abilities of destroying the enemy one time, he just went right over there and kicked out those Philistines out again, didn't he? Did he? No, what did it say? Therefore, David inquired again. See, we got people coming to the altar and shouting all kind of scripture. That don't mean a hell of beans to the devil. He could care less if you can quote scripture. He could care less. Only thing he cares about is whether you believe it. The only thing he cares about is if you stand on it. The only thing he cares about is when you speak it. There's an authority behind what you speak. God's not talking about playing church. God's not calling you to play church. He's not calling you to be a part of a religion. He's calling you to be a part of an army. He's calling you to be a part of an army. Registered in that army. And let me tell you something. If anyone here has been in the army, you know what I'm talking about. When they give you an order, you don't question that order. You don't say, well, I just don't feel like it today. To see where you'd be. 
You're in the military and they give you an order, you say, yes, sir, and you go and you do that thing that they want to do, even if it means risking your life, and you put your fear aside, you move forward and with, the, with your fellow soldiers and you fight that battle. Come on. What about God's army? We sing that song on with Christian soldiers marching through the land. Come on. You're in, an, you're in the service of God. When you're in the military, you have no rights of your own. You can't just go to your, commandator, your, your commander and say, I, I'm going home for the weekend. I need to put some uh, cream on my body because my body aches from all the exercise. I'm going to go home and rest it for the weekend. Uh, you know what? The enemy will laugh at you. Let me tell you about the enemy. The enemy has snipers waiting for you. And they come in all shapes and sizes. And they come in all kinds of familiar faces. <laughs> they even come as friends. They even come as people who care. But they're snipers. They want to assassinate your faith. They're assassins. They want to take away your faith from God. They want to take away your anointing. But I'm here to tell you this morning, hallelujah. I'm not giving up my anointing. I'm not for sale for anybody. I'm not going to be for sale and kind of whimper and, and, and kind of shrivel up because somebody might leave the church. I'm not doing it. If you want to be coddled and you want to be uh, stroked, if you will, then go to a seeker-friendly church. It won't care about how you come in. won't care about how you go out. won't care whether you stand before God and He condemns you to hell. Hello. You look to that pastor and say, why didn't you tell me? He's in the same place you are. He's an assassin. Do you know that devil has ministers who are assassins too? The Bible says, marvel not, for Satan himself can be transformed into an angel of light. Don't you marvel that even his ministers can be made as ministers of righteousness. But they have a false anointing. David, again, inquired of the Lord. And this time God said, don't go up against him. Turn away from them. And then he says, you come upon them. Over against the mulberry tree. When I saw that tree this morning, and I'm telling you, that, that tree was shaking. It wasn't just a little breeze. It, and it, was, it wasn't something that lasted like a minute. This thing lasted for about three to four minutes. It just kept, those leaves kept going back and forth like, and I'm talking like this. And there was like a gush of wind that went through that tree. And I'm, stand, I'm sitting there at the light, and I'm, I'm watching this thing, and I'm saying, mulberry tree. Mulberry tree. And the Holy Spirit said, you're going to preach this morning on the mulberry tree. I want you to understand, what I'm preaching to you today, I have no notes. This is Holy Ghost. I didn't put it all together in my office. I still had my slide, if you will, on the computer. God said, no, you're going to preach about the mulberry tree. Why did God tell him to go over against the mulberry tree? Why would he tell somebody that? That doesn't make any sense. Why go over to the tree? Well, you're going to understand in just a moment. 
How many would like to know the significance of that mulberry tree? Okay, come back next week, I'll tell you. Here it is. To every Israelite, to every Jewish person, Lord, this is going to be a blessing. Every Jewish person, every Israelite, when they heard the word mulberry tree, it was from that tree that they made coffins. But God was telling them, you go by the mulberry. Your enemy is going to be put in coffins. When they saw the object lesson of that mulberry tree, they knew, hallelujah, that they had the victory. Even though God said, don't go up against them, I'm going to take care of them for you, and I'm going to show you in a visible object lesson. Go by that mulberry tree. And when you, oh, come on. And it shall be when thou shalt hear a sound of going in the tops of the mulberry tree. Then you will go out to battle. For God is gone forth before, say it with me, before, before you. How is that symbolic to you and I? When we stand be behind, when we stand near the mulberry tree, we got to make sure we're dead to self. That self is in the coffin. Because you can't get angry at the devil in the flesh, because you know what? He'll bop you upside the head. When you take authority, it's got to be in the name of the Lord, not in your own strength. When you go to that mulberry tree, spiritually, you go in the power of being joined together with Christ and dead indeed unto a Christ, but alive unto God. Come on, somebody. When you, when you, he says, when you shall hear a sound, you hear the sound of going in the tops of the mulberry tree. Hallelujah. You remember the Israelites when they were in Egypt? And Pharaoh made a decree that all the firstborn would be dead. Moses said, no, that's not going to happen to us. It's going to happen to you. And when the death angel came, come on, somebody. What was the thing that protected the Israelites? It was the blood. Not your own strength, not your own ability. Not your own power, not your own wisdom, not your own strategy. It was the blood. You can't have death without a blood being spilled. Look at this. He says, thou shalt go to battle, for God has gone forth before you to smite the host of the Philistines. David therefore did as God suggested. Is that what it says? God didn't suggest it. He commanded it. <laughs> and they smote the host of the Philistines from Gibeon even to Gazir. Then something happened in verse 17. And the fame of David went out into all lands. And the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. Do you see the progression of the anointing here? It started with one man. It went to a whole army. And now it went to a whole nation. Come on. By him obeying God, 
And let me tell you something. You may feel insignificant. You may not feel like you're nothing in God. Let me tell you something. You obey God, you'd be surprised that how God can use you to open up nations. Brought the fear from all nations. And in chapter 15, verse 1, I'll only be a few more minutes. It says, And David made him houses in the city of David. In other words, when the enemy's been dealt with, now you can go on with your plans. So David began to make houses in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God. Now, this particular portion of Scripture is not talking about the first time when he took the ark of God and put it on the cart. This was the second time when he learned his lesson, after it came out of the house of Obed-Edom. And God blessed that house for three months. This was after. But before the presence of God could be restored, there had to be the anointing. God had to first put the anointing back on someone to be able to bring forth the defeat of the Philistines. Not once, but twice. For what purpose? The purpose is for this, to restore the presence of God. Can I tell you, the church at large today has lost the anointing because instead of standing up against the enemy, they have made a peace agreement with the enemy. They have made a contractual agreement with the enemy. It's called social acceptability, seeker friendly, don't want to offend anybody, don't want to mention about hell. Don't want to mention about sin. Don't want to mention about anything like that. All we want to mention is the love of God. They have made an agreement with the Philistines. And let me tell you, the way the church is going today, I was talking to somebody about this, who's very deep in missions. And they said this generation of people that are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, when if the Lord tarries and that generation passes, there'll be no more giving of missions. Because it's that section of people are the ones that really give in missions, that have a heart for missions. If the church continues in the deteriorating that it's going, do you understand what's happening? Do you understand that the Philistines have crept into the church? And they've come into the church where there's no more altars. We were talking about it earlier. There's no more altars anymore. There's no more crosses up on the platform. There's no more pulpits anymore. There are tables with cups of coffee. And a pastor with holy jeans. Sitting down, sipping coffee and giving you a 20 minute sermonette. About how good you are. And how blessed you're going to be. Not telling you or preparing you for war. Can I tell you, it's a preparation for war in the spiritual realm. The Bible says the devil knows his time is short. And he's coming with all hell's fury against the church. And the church isn't a building. The church is you. It's me. It's our families. And he's coming to destroy and to kill and to rob. That's his itinerary. And it's up to you and I to seek the anointing. And saying, Lord... I'm not going to allow any of this. I need the anointing 
to stand up boldly in my home. I need the anointing to stand up against the ungodliness of the school. I'm not going to let them teach my children that two men is the same as a husband and wife. Doesn't mean you hate them. But the church has not operated under the anointing for so long, they don't even know the presence of God is gone. They don't even experience what we experienced here today. It is the moving of the Holy Ghost. Because they have not the anointing. And you better believe what I'm telling you right now. You need the anointing. You need to put your ideologies, your phraseologies, what you think in the toilet. And go by what God said. He said, get ready. Because you're in the battle. Get ready. He said, for all those who will live Godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Come on, somebody. This is, this is good. The anointing's good. You know, it may bring sorrow. It may bring conviction. It may bring Holy Ghost. But let me tell you something. The end result is the enemy is defeated. You're building houses. Hallelujah. You're like instituting the presence of God back in your life, in your home. You can't get excited about that, your wood's wet. You can't get excited about God bringing back the presence. Oh, come on. When David saw the ark coming down the road, he saw that ark of God that was in the hands of the enemy. Come on, let me tell you something. The presence of God has been in the hands of the enemy long enough. It's time that we dispel all these false Hood about Christianity and the church. It's time that we dispel all of those things and say, you know what? I'm not going to go the way of the social gospel. I'm not going to go the way of the seeker-friendly church. I'm not going to go in the uh, emergent church way where I don't even, they don't even believe the Bible anymore. I'm not doing it. I'm going for the anointing. I'm going to seek God for the anointing. And I'm going to inquire of the Lord what he wants me to do with that anointing. And I'm going to wait upon God for that anointing. And when I get that anointing, I'm going to make sure that things are put right. Because I want the presence of God back in my heart, in my life, in my home, in my family. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want it back, Lord. We want it back in the church, Lord. Can I tell you when that happens and the ark is coming back and the ark represents the presence of God and when David saw uh, coming down the road, it was quite a distance off, but he saw it and he knew exactly what it was because there was an anointing on him. And when you have an anointing, you know what the presence of God is and what is not the presence of God. And he knew when he saw the ark coming down the road. Hallelujah. It says that David, he just stood there and said, oh, praise God. No, the Bible says he began to dance. Hallelujah. He began to dance. He began to praise God. Why was he so excited? Well, if you've been going through a dead time in Israel where there was no presence of God and there was no, uh, uh, there was no uh, acceptance of God for what they were doing, they were compromising. But now things have been changed by the anointing. Things were changed by the anointing. Come on, somebody. The anointing is going to fall on you right now. They would change when the anointing came. Hallelujah. And they begin to dance and said, oh, the spirit of the Lord is here. I will dance like David danced. Hallelujah. I'll get excited. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, I see people get excited over a football game, a baseball game. They stand and cheer and wave their hand. They yell and scream. But when it comes to Jesus...
because you have no anointing in your life. You get excited about the wrong things. But it's time. Can I tell you it's time. It's time to restore. Let me tell you that church that you see out there in the world. It's all headed for the one world church. Under the spirit of the uh, Antichrist and the false spirit. And the, the, uh, the beast. It's all heading in that direction. They're all coming together. And the church without the anointing is going to fall for it. The church that's not anointed is going to fall for it. And they're going to be accepted sociability. And they're going to have lots of people in it. But Jesus said, narrow is the way. And few there be that find it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many go in. They're at. That's why you and I, we have a job to do. When the anointing comes, is to share the gospel. Not only with our families, but to take that anointing. As Jesus said, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. For what purpose? He has called me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up the wounds. Come on, somebody. Can I tell you, the church has been wounded. The church has been blinded. It's time for Jesus to take his rightful place in the church once again as the head. Not the board meetings. Not the boards to take authority. But to listen to the head. Do what David did. He inquired of the Lord. I encourage boards. Boards are good. As long as they don't usurp the authority over God. Leadership's good. As long as their leadership doesn't overtake God and his leadership. And so David, he took the ark and he saw it coming down the road. But it wasn't on a cot this time. It was on the Levite's shoulders. Hallelujah. And let me tell you something. When you carry the presence of God and you carry worship properly, because the church is all messed up when it comes to worship. They think it's about themselves and what they get out of it. That's not about worship. That's about entertainment and making you feel good and making you feel goosebumps and ducky bites all over. That's not what worship is about. Worship is God gets the glory. You're worshiping God. And if you get a benefit from that, praise God. If you sense his presence overwhelmingly in his love and his whatever he does for you in that moment, that's great. But that's not why you worship. You worship because he deserves it. Because of who he is. And when you restore, when you restore the presence of the Lord back into the church, things will begin to happen. Hallelujah. Can I get a good amen? amen. Hallelujah. So when you get discouraged, Praise God, my pants keep falling down. It's because of my big belly, but I'm going to be faster, so that's going to be going away. But let me tell you, when you begin, when you begin to walk in the anointing, things will change. You can say for years and years, it hasn't changed. This hasn't changed. I've been waiting for this. I've been waiting for that. I've been waiting for this. You've been waiting because you know why? You're trying to do it without the anointing. I've been praying, and God, God hasn't answered. God answered David right away. He says, he entreated the Lord. The Lord answered him right away. Here it is. Here's your answer, David. Don't go up. But go stand by the mulberry tree. I want you to remember this. When you feel surrounded in your emotions and your feelings, like the enemy is attacking you, go stand by the mulberry tree. <laughs> Woo! Come on, somebody. Because that mulberry tree represents death. That means that God is on the, God is on the scene. Hallelujah. And he's going to wipe out your enemy. Hallelujah. Can I get a good amen? Let's all stand this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say, Lord, I want that anointing. Not just to have a tingly feeling, but, Lord, that I can deal with some situations. That, Lord, I can begin to take authority. 
I can begin to restore what the enemy has stolen. That I can restore the years, listen to me, the years that the canker worm and the pommel worm have destroyed. Because I need the anointing. I need the anointing. So tell them this morning, say, God, I need your anointing. More than anything else, more than getting all of my things accomplished that I got to get accomplished today, I need the anointing. Can I tell you, there was a time, there was a time when we would tarry at the altar. Now you can't, you can't wait to run out of the building. You can't wait to get out of the building. You got to run, run out right away. You don't come and tarry before the Lord. Well, let me tell you, the way to get the anointing is through tarrying. You sit before the Lord. Come down here, get on your face before God. Where is, where is that out of that? That's gone in many churches today. That's gone. Are we still on Facebook? Cut that music because they'll cut us off. It's fine? Okay. You want that anointing. How many of you have gone through battles and have lost? How many of you have gone through some battles and you've lost the battle? Come on, be honest. One more time. Come on up to the altar. One more time. You had some battles, but you lost. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. When you ask God for the anointing once again, and you don't, take, you don't take the devil and make a covenant agreement with him. And you say, devil, I'm not making no covenant agreement with you. I want the anointing. And that's what I want you to say right here at the altar. God, I'm not making any covenant agreement with the enemy. I'm not allowing rebellion in my life, in my home, in my church, in my situation. I want the anointing that breaks every yoke. Oh, rabababo, shaka, babaka. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I remind you, Sister Annie, of that mulberry tree and the command to pursue. <laughs> 